Hello, everyone. My name is Tom. Uh, I'm a data engineer and architect at uh, Quantum Black. And this talk is writing and scaling collaborative data pipelines with Kedro. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. A little bit about myself. Uh, I've been doing uh, data engineering for actually quite some time. Uh, I started out at Palantir back in 2013, uh, which was actually before data engineering really became a thing. Uh, so I've been doing it for as long as data engineering has uh, existed in the mainstream, I suppose. Um, I uh, also have a, a little bit of uh, hobbies of uh, doing yoga uh, as well as teaching meditation. So if anyone is, is curious about yoga or meditation, very happy to talk about those kinds of things here. Uh, so here's a, here I am doing a, a Shirshasana 2 pose uh, on two fingers. Um, and I also run a YouTube channel that talks about Kedra and a little bit more uh, information about that later. Um, so the talk itself, uh, writing data pipelines with Kedro, uh, writing and scaling collaborative data pipelines with Kedro, uh, this can also be called uh, instead architecting your pipelines with the Kedro framework. Um, for, for the way that pipelines have been written up until now, and this is back since like, as I mentioned, um, like only in the past recent years has data engineering really become a thing. Uh, unfortunately, the truth is that it's a relatively new discipline. And since it's a relatively new discipline, there's not that much around it in terms of like best practices or kind of like established methodologies. Uh, and as a result, I mean, data pipelines that we write uh, and the things that we do kind of go all over the place. Uh, and so I think like this is something that we at uh, Quantum Black kind of observed and, the, and something that we wanted to address by using Kedro. Uh, really quickly, I also want to mention that my colleagues uh, are in the uh, Discord chat room and hashtag uh, Talk Kedro. Uh, and they're actually one of them, Yetu, she's the product manager of Kedro. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to talk in the Discord itself. And that way uh, they can get access to your questions and perhaps answer them better than I can. Um, okay, so um, let me go ahead and... and uh, Go to the next one. I have a little bit of a demo right away uh, for us to play with. So let's go ahead and talk about pipelines. Um, so with pipelines themselves, it's a little bit easier to, to visualize some of these things. And we can begin to describe why do data pipelines kind of grow out of control? Um, and then what are the kind of contributing factors? And how can we reel that in? So let me stop this share really quickly and then reshare one of my other screens here. Okay, so you should be able to see a Chrome window, is that true? Yes. And here I have. The demo. Um, so so again, I only see pipelines are just a little FYI. Bit. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it should be popping up in just a second. Here it is. So what I have here is a modification of a data pipeline visualization tool that we use. And this is called Kedro Viz, Kedro Visualization. Uh, it's a very powerful tool when coupled with Kedro. And in this case, I've customized it to kind of demonstrate how data pipelines can grow and change over time. Um, so here, you know, is like your typical data pipeline. It kind of already is like going all over the place, right? The real question is, how did we get here? Why is it so all over the place? Um, and what can we do about it? Right? So data pipelines, before they get to this kind of state, they start out always very small. You have a data source, and then you have a cleaning function or some kind of transformation function on top of that data source. Right? This is how we always get. Uh, once you run your transforming function, you get this output. And so in this case, we have this clean iris which cleans this iris data and then outputs this cleaned iris data. And then once you have this formatted iris data, you want to start analyzing it. You want to begin your analysis. Uh, and so you have another function that does your an analysis, which then outputs your iris analysis, obviously, here. Um, this is usually like how data pipelines start out. They're just very simple, very typical. But as soon as you want to expand any of the work involved, of course, you need to start offshooting. 
And so you might want to take your iris data and then start to like split it out into uh, training sets and example sets. So you can try to predict some attributes of the data itself. You feed it through your modeling engine, you feed it through your uh, accuracy reporting mechanisms, and you can see how things start to expand out. And this is just for one data source. What happens when you have several others come into the, come into the picture? You know, you have your companies, your shuttles. You also want to do this very similar like cleaning processing and uh, saving of that data. And then finally, you're going to want to connect everything together. <laughs> and this is where the mess starts to happen here. Um, the truth is that these kinds of, the, the, this process itself uh, is very similar to how software also kind of like sprawls and grows, right? Um, but because of the way that we have, I mean, because of how new data pipelines are into like the software world, we, we don't really have these established methodologies for controlling and constraining the way that pipelines grow. And as a result, that's why we become a little bit uh, almost like arrested. Now, there's, a, there's a plateau onto how big and how powerful our data pipelines can become. Uh, and as a result, they never grow past this stage that you see here. Uh, but thanks to Kedro as a framework for growing, scaling, and writing these data pipelines, you can go from something like this to something even larger. And so here is actually a, another typical pipeline that you would see on a project. And I actually myself have worked in projects where we have pipelines that are quite literally 10 times this size, and we have a developer count that is in the dozens. Uh, and because of the way that Kedro works, we're still able to collaborate effectively and properly maintain that data pipeline. So Kedro is a very powerful framework for how we architect it. And so we're gonna go in a little bit into those details now here. Let me go ahead and share my slides yet again. I'll share like this. Okay, so now we kind of talked about the pipelines themselves. What are the, how do pipelines grow? Well, pipelines grow because they're kind of like centered around our teams. We have teams of data engineers as well as data scientists. And the truth is that the typical data engineer and the typical data scientist they're not necessarily super compatible, right? They're, they almost are opposites in many ways. Uh, so you'll see that data scientists may not be engineers, for example. Uh, they have a lot of like amazing knowledge of these particular like modeling topics and the way that we can transform data, but they might not necessarily have those engineering practices uh, in their tool belt. Furthermore, data science as uh, a discipline tends towards more experimentation. And this requires having faster data pipelines or rather being closer to the data. So you wanna be as close to the data as possible when you're a data scientist in order to manipulate, experiment and kind of play with the data. Now on the other side of the spectrum, the data engineers have the opposite problems they might not be scientists necessarily. They might have more engineering backgrounds. And so when you're a data engineer, you might not know a lot of the ways that someone can model pipelines or how you transform data. Um, and furthermore, the things that you're most interested in is order. You wanna keep things kind of like neat and tidy. You wanna abstract away things as much as possible in order to sustain uh, that robust stability. Uh, and so, Oh, and there is one problem with both of them is that they both still must clean the data. And so data cleaning itself is just like a, a whole topic by itself, uh, but it's something that is inescapable. Uh, and it's quite interesting because the way that you clean the data uh, changes the way that you analyze the data too. And so this is a, this is a collaborative problem that both of these team members must uh, tackle together. Because if the data engineer doesn't necessarily clean the data in the correct way, and the data scientist instead um, uh, gets the data in an incorrect clean format, then it's hard for them to do their analysis and the data engineer, it's hard for them to uh, take any analysis out from the data scientist. So cleaning, cleansing is definitely an important portion of this. Um, and then finally, what you'll see is that data pipelines are almost always asked to be in production right now, right? The reason why you write these data pipelines and do these data analyses 
is because the business wants some facts. They want some insights. They want you to take things out as soon as possible and, and give it to them immediately, right? So these are kind of the problems centered around data pipelines. Can we find a balance with these two guys, right? So how can we find a balance with collaborating with data engineers and data scientists in a way that doesn't necessarily introduce so much friction, so much process, but still maintains that fluidity that the data scientists need, as well as that the data engineers need in order to make their pipeline stable and still agile. Uh, and that's actually just an immediate need. The final need is, is it ready for the handoff? One day, those data engineers and those data scientists may not necessarily be working on that data pipeline anymore. Is that data pipeline ready to be handed off to another team to pick up the baton. Uh, and I think like this one is actually the most fascinating to solve. Because when you think about it, when you hand off a data pipeline and you're handing it off to another person, right? That's a person down the line, someone who has no knowledge of your data pipeline. The truth is that that person can actually still be you when you think about it, right? Because in the future, two months, three months, four months in the future, you'll find that you might not remember anything about your data pipeline. And when you come back to the data pipeline, you look at it and you have no idea what's going on. So effectively, you yourself can be that person in the future that you're handing the baton off to, right? This is your past self and then your future self. Uh, and so is your past self really creating a pipeline that your future self can handle? I think that's, a, that's something that we need to definitely uh, keep track of. And so this is something, the, these problems are things that Quantum Black uh, discovered in their work. And so Quantum Black, if you're unfamiliar, uh, they're a startup that came out of London, very famous for some of the cases that they worked on uh, in terms of data analysis for uh, F1 cars. And so McKinsey picked them up and brought them in as their data science, data engineering arm of the firm. Uh, and so Quantum Black, they do, they do hundreds of these projects uh, all over the world for data pipelines and uh, data science and data analysis. Uh, and they found that they kept running into these similar patterns across all of these different projects. And so instead, what they did was they tried to codify this, these processes and bring them back into Kedro. And this is in order to uh, maintain and make it easier, not only for the data scientists and data engineers to work together, but also to allow handoff to the clients that we would work with. And so QB um, open sourced Kedro last year uh, and it's been growing ever since. Uh, and so, yep, why does Kedro exist? It, it really is that um, collective learning, trying to deliver those applications. And our product mission, I think is really fantastic. It's, a, it's this empathetic intention, right? How can we tweak our workflows so that our coding practices are the same, right? <clears throat> and so I like this word empathy here because it really, it really is important uh, to think about code in, in a way that allows other people to help you with the code and you to help other people with the code. And so I kind of think of this as like almost altruistic programming in a way where the way that you write the code is not for your own selfish intention, to get things done right now, but really for the benefit of people who are going to be reading that code later on. And what I found is that that return on investment of making the code readable, maintainable, and understandable is really, really uh, beneficial. Uh, and this comes and pays in dividends uh, later down the line. Okay, so how does Kedro solve these problems? So let's, let's think about like how data pipelines really are set up. Uh, and how we can break them down. So um, let's take an example here. Let's imagine audio as data. So literally just like your audio signals, let's just imagine those as data. Um, we can think of those as things that we would want to push through like data pipelines and et cetera. And so you have this kind of like, for audio, you have standard inputs and outputs. You have standard mechanisms that can take input from the environment and then output things into you know, somewhere else, right? And so we have like microphones, we have amplifiers, um, we have like compressors. There's a lot of technology that goes into audio engineering uh, and we want those, those inputs and outputs to be standard. Next, 
we also want to have these kind of transforming mechanisms here. Um, and so actually the one that I mentioned earlier, these kind of like microphone compressors, for example, or these kind of mixing boards where you can modify your, your, your equalization on the audio itself. And so these guys will transform the audio in a way that can uh, affect it for the needs that you have with like, your low pass filters, your high pass filters, et cetera. Um, and this is something here that is overlooked. And I would argue that this is uh, one of the most important parts. It's not the most important part here, is that you want to be able to redirect your output, right? We're actually, this is very similar to abstracting your API, right? We want to make sure that each of the components in our audio system can easily talk with other components in the audio system. So when you have a microphone input, you want to be able to put that microphone's output either into your mixing board, into those compressors, into those filters, et cetera, et cetera. So having this ability to plug and play different portions is really vital there. And then finally, you wanna have this convention for organization. How do we actually structure our audio engineering setup in order to most effectively do our work, right? And so here we have like a setup you got your microphones here, you got your audio mixers here, you got your computer over here, you know where everything is. And because you know where everything is, you know where to find things, you know where, you know where to adjust things, and you know how to tweak things as you desire. And concepts back into pipeline building. And so we have here a quick demo also uh, regarding Kedro. And so let me go ahead and pull up my where is my mouse oh, my mouse has disappeared there it is okay I'm just gonna stop the share really quickly make sure that I have this guy here in place and then let me share this screen once more okay great so here we have just um, our CLI here, um, or, and inside of the CLI, uh, it's very simple to go ahead and get started with Kentra. Actually, before we go ahead and do this one, let me share a different screen, which shows an example of what data pipelines can look like, um, just like as a raw example. And so here we go like this. This is the one here. Okay, I think that that should be showing up. Um, do you see a uh, Jupyter Notebook? I think that's available now. Okay. So here we have a, an, a, an example like pipeline, which we're breaking down iris data. Um, and so the truth is that uh, this is what you see in a typical data pipeline, right? you have like a single Jupyter Notebook um, Oh, this is the wrong one. This is the one here. Is this it? Okay. Um, you have a single Jupyter Notebook and you're suddenly like inundated with a whole bunch of programming that, I mean, there's a whole bunch of code here. There's a lot of things going on and you don't really know how to approach this guy, right? And if you're lucky, you're gonna find that there's gonna be functions, things are gonna be broken down in kind of like, you know, ways that you can understand. But more often than not, you're gonna find notebooks that just have a plus like just just no just I mean I'm sorry just code splatted on there all doing these kinds of different things and it's difficult to kind of trace and understand so what happens usually is that you just go through you look at the notebook you begin to like run the notebook uh, and then you hope that it works right <laughs> and of course what will happen is you're going to be missing out on some data and you don't know where things are you don't know how things are tweaked you don't know where parameters sit um, and that's an unfortunate thing uh, that happens here. Um, but we can start to break this down into those four components that we kind of mentioned earlier. Um, and those four components are, right, the first one is the standardized inputs and outputs. So right here we have uh, an input and we have these outputs here. Uh, Pandas data frames uh, is, a, is, of course, our, our well-beloved mechanism for making our pipelines and they have they come with different reading and writing mechanisms and so this is like an example of that standardized input and output you can use this to interface um, with your system to read our csvs 
and then output the CSVs as you please. So that's the standardization there. Then we have our transformations, right? This is kind of split data. Um, so this split data here, we'll take a data frame and then we'll split it out into our train X, train Y, test X, test Y. And so in modeling, of course, this is just to uh, actually train the model and then test the model on, uh, example, on, on the data that we're, we're, we're using. Um, and so this right here can be considered that kind of transformation. These are actually pure functions, which will take an input, modify the input, and then give you an output. And there's gonna be no actual side effects. So this is kind of a, a transformation here. Um, next, we, we have these guys here. And so you see this three in, in a row, and this is where notebooks as pipelines kind of break down. Um, it's like, how do we start to string all of these different data frames together, right? We're getting the inputs or we're getting the outputs uh, and it becomes hard to figure out where things are coming from where. Um, you have to pray that someone has named your variables correctly and, and you have to manually trace uh, things as in, in, in this manner. And so uh, the, and, and yeah, this is where things get broken down because obviously there is literally no convention where when you set up your notebooks and you set up your uh, your normal data pipelines. And so this is where things start to break down completely. Um, and now let me show you what this pipeline actually looks like inside of Kedro. Uh, so Kedro actually comes with a lot of really great uh, command line functions. Let me share this screen. Uh, and so in order to start a Kedro project, First, you have to install Kedro, very easy. You can get it with, use, with a pip install Kedro. That'll go to the PyPy package index, uh, grab it, download it, install it. It's very simple, straightforward. Then what you can do is you can actually use Kedro new in order to create a new pipeline. And this allows you to like name your pipeline and then create the project. So we're just gonna really quickly say EuroPython 2020 as a Kedro project and then EP as the package name. We will generate the example of pipeline. And there we go, we've already created our pipeline. Let's open this guy up here and I'll open this up in PyCharm. And now that something that's really cool um, also, and I will show you guys that a little bit later if we have time, is that Kedra also has now comes with these kind of starter templates, um, which allows you to modify how Kedra creates those um, modify those initial conventions. Um, but here I'm just going to show you what Kedro comes with. And so you can see here on the left, we have a few different things going on. We have here our, um, we have here our uh, configuration folder, a source folder, and then like these data folders, logs, docs, and notebooks. Uh, and so all of these guys are actually related to that original like template that we were talking about, right? How do we organize our pipeline? And so right from the get-go, Kedro gives you an example of how you can start to organize things. Uh, and, it, and it helps us with our separation of concerns, right? So in the previous example, we didn't really know where data was going, where data was coming from, how we were reading the data. And not only that, but everything inside of that previous pipeline is actually hard coded, right? Everything inside of that pipeline was hard coded. Let me share this desktop again and I can show you that example. And so right here, for example, the read CSV path, this is hard coded. This train.1, train, I mean, train one, train two, test one, test two, this is also hard coded. And then there's also parameters inside of our functions. We have like our test data ratio, which is hard coded here. All these things are hard coded. Uh, and so as a result, like you find that pipelines themselves are very difficult to maintain because you don't know where anything is. But thanks to Kedro, we make that easier. We put our configurations here inside of this configuration folder, and then we can instead parameterize how we start to uh, find our data sets, right? And so here we have the location of the data set and how we want to read that data set. So we're just using this pandas data frame to read it in, um, read in that CSV file, uh, and then we use Kedro itself to kind of uh, bring things together. And so in that other portion here that we were talking about, we don't really know how things are, the relationships, how these are, are, are built. We instead have these uh, pipelines. And so inside of our pipelines, 
we can start to see the relationships. And so we see those same examples here of this train model uh, predict um, taking these inputs and these outputs um, and then putting them through the pipeline themselves. Uh, and so actually we can even visualize this guy uh, because of because everything is standardized, we can uh, we can programmatically extract the pipeline itself and then um, present the pipeline to the user. And so, if we go here to this web page, we can see that Ketchel visualization. And so, suddenly, you begin to understand like how your your pipeline is built. It becomes easier to explore it, uh, and then easier to understand because we are separating things into these different uh, concerns here. Um, and then, so um, as that is the case, uh, I only have a few minutes left, so let me just rush through these guys really quickly. Um, we have that catalog of those standardized inputs. We support a lot of different inputs and outputs. Um, we have the nodes and pipelines. So the nodes are those transformations themselves. The pipelines pull things together. Uh, the configuration, this is where we uh, have our variables that we would otherwise be hard coding, kept inside of one folder so you know where they are as well as the project template. And so this is the standardization of everything together. Um, and once we employed Kedra, we found this consistent time to production, reusable analytic code stores, increased collaboration, and even upskilling of our developers uh, who otherwise would not have exposure to these kinds of software practices. And so of course, pip install Kedra, we can visualize, uh, and then we actually have some deployment mechanisms built in. So Kedra Docker, Kedra Airflow. So you can immediately deploy these pipelines as you are. I mean, as they are, and we have a great support team. Uh, so we are on, we have our own Slack, uh, Slack channel internally. Um, and then we have like Stack Overflow, read the docs, and then our GitHub, which come back into our Slack channel. And we also have a budding community. I run a, I run a YouTube channel uh, called Data Engineer One, where I mainly talk about Kedro. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more, uh, my, I mean, I've got a ton of videos there talking about Kedro there. Um, and I think that we have about two more minutes left. So why don't we uh, go ahead and open the floor for maybe like a few questions. And I think uh, <laughs> I probably rushed through that last bit, but um, there's, there's, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions and I think there's a lot of great stuff to, to talk about on Kedro. Um, and so you can find us there inside of the uh, talk-kedro discord channel. Uh, where again, the, the product manager, as well as one of our tech evangelists is there, uh, available to talk about Kedra a little bit more. Um, but going through this, this final example here, um, normally the hardest part about a pipeline is figuring out how to run it. And thanks to Kedra, we do have this ability to just simply move into the directory and then type in Kedra run. And this will run our Kedra pipeline. And so this standardization allows anybody who is familiar with the Kedro framework to enter into any other Kedro project, run the Kedro project as they wish to, and break it down and understand it as necessary. And so I think this is why uh, some of these, the, the benefits of Kedro there um, become evident as you begin to use it and you begin to expand your data pipelines and collaborate uh, with the rest of your team members. Uh, and I think that's time for me. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, Hope I can come and come back again and speak with you guys soon. All right, thank you so much. And uh, thank you. Actually, uh, yeah, technically we're kind of towards the we're kind of right up against the clock here. But as the closing session is not until uh, was well, twenty minutes from now. So I, I think I don't think and there's no one else behind you. So I don't think there's a problem in, in asking a couple of questions now. Um, cool. so, um, one is, uh, is it possible if I just use Kedro viz feature, right? Is that possible if I just use the Kedro viz feature? Yes, absolutely. And so the Kedro viz by itself is an open source, uh, library that you can use with any kinds of, um, node or graph structures. Uh, it just takes a simple JSON, um, JSON file, which shows the linkings between different nodes. Uh, then a list of nodes, and then you can actually use it. And in fact, we have a React component, which means you can embed that visualization into any kind of um, front end uh, that is using React. So it's actually really quite cool. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. 
Um, and then uh, the other question I have here is Kedro configuration. Is it difficult or no? So for the configuration itself, um, it's actually quite straightforward to set up the pipeline. And then for the configuration of your nodes, for example, um, inside of data science, we have uh, inside of the split, uh, so that split data, we had actually a hard coded value for how, what, what the split ratio was. And so that's here inside of um, this example, Jupyter Notebook, we have a 0 0.2. In Kedro, um, the way that it works, is that pipelines, you, you, you give to the pipeline the name of the data asset that you wish to use. And so here we have the iris data as a data asset, as well as the parameters. And so your parameters actually become data assets by themselves, which means that you can actually keep all of your parameters inside of a parameter folder or a parameter configuration. So here we have our example test data ratio is written right here. And so that means that we don't need to change any hard coded values if we wish to update our parameters and then rerun our pipeline. So in this example, I can easily change the ratio from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 and then immediately rerun the pipeline and then get a different output there. Yeah. So it's very, very easy to handle the configuration. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, anyone who wants to chat with um, uh, Tom or uh, any of the rest of the Kedro crew, Quantum Black crew, check out the uh, Talk Kedro chat room on Discord, and they'll all be hanging out there. Uh, and I, if I remember correctly, you guys also have a sprint uh, tomorrow, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's correct. And I think we've opened it up to um, work with people to contribute and, and work on the Kedro project. And uh, I myself have a lot of pull requests into Ketro. It's very easy. It's a great way to get started with open source projects because the community is very dedicated um, and we're backed by a lot of great engineers in our London office. Awesome. So yeah, we are, we are a little bit over time, everyone. So these other two questions, uh, please do uh, repost those. So Diego and Steven, I do see you guys. Uh, please do repost those over in the uh, Ketro chat room. I really appreciate that. And uh, uh, to everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. So stay tuned at um, in uh, about 15 minutes, we're going to have the closing session. So always sad to see the end of, uh, of uh, another EuroPython, uh, but uh, hey, uh, all, good, all good things must come to an end. And I uh, hope you've really enjoyed uh, your time. Uh, also, typically, we'll only pass the talks section. So we still have sprints over the next two days. So please do hang out for that. Also, after the closing session, we have some fun in the after party here in the Microsoft room. So that is Word Peril, the Python word game where you win absolutely nothing. So we'll be taking volunteers from the audience. Maybe I'll see you there, Tom. Um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, anyone who's interested in joining in on that, that'll be, uh, that'll be starting at uh, 2130 in this uh, channel. Uh, so see you all uh, hopefully uh, in the next 15 minutes for the closing session and uh, thanks for joining us.